everybody this is mr bear and the purpose of this video were, will be for a push students to review the first two periods uh that are on the ap exam so that starts in 1491 which is before columbus to 1607 which is jamestown so i often classify these the first period at least as being the sort of pre-european era then period two is 1607 to 1754, which you do have early English colonies. So this is going to mush those two periods together. Um, talk about pre-Columbian America, talk about pre-British America, and then like the early um, British colonies before uh, the Seven Years' War, aka the French and Indian War. So uh, this will cover the key concepts and uh, sort of highlight some of the things that may appear on the exam uh, for periods one and two. All right, so for period one and two, we're really looking at before America was British. Uh, I said European in my intro, that's a mistake. I mean, I, the first period is pre-English influence and period two is uh, sort of the transfer of power from Spanish to English influence in the American colonies. So the period dates, uh, 1491 obviously is pre-Columbus, 1492 being Columbus's voyage. Uh, another important turning point was 1588 when the English defeated the Spanish Armada, which would allow for more English entry into the colonies in the future. And the period ends in 1607 with the first permanent settlement by the Joint Stock Company um, in Jamestown. So yeah, so some of the bookmark dates that are important, 1491 to 1607, squeeze in Columbus and the defeat of the Spanish Armada. The first major concept is uh, pre-European contact where Indians lived. And basically the, the concept to remember is uh, based off of a physical geography, it sort of influenced what sort of communities Indian tribes had. So if they lived on the coast, often they had a more mixed society of both hunting and gathering with a sort of a mixture of semi-permanent um, residents. Uh, out west on the plains, they were much more nomadic. Um, and in the southwest where they were maize growers, they were often more stationary, such as the Pueblo people. So that takes me to some of the vocabulary um, maize being a very critical thing in the American Southwest with the Pueblo. Um, both the Great Basin and the Great Plains Indian tribes were very nomadic. Basically, the Great Plains, I view it about the bison and the buffalo, and the Great Basin is more in the mountains, think like Wyoming and Colorado. Um, they would follow the antelope, not the bison, but uh, they're very similar. The Great Basin and the Great Plains were both nomadic. Um, in sort of the middle of North America was the Mississippian culture, uh, which is a very early Indian tribe, and they are known for constructing these huge agricultural mounds, uh, one of which is in Cahokia, Illinois. And this sort of connects the dots between Central American cultures and Native American cultures, you know, the sort of ziggurat shape kind of transferring from Central America into North American Indian tribes. Um, Indians on the coast often, you know, utilize the ocean for fishing needs. Um, and uh, the coastal areas tended to be a little more stationary than the center of America. So basically where Indians lived uh, impacted what sort of lives they lived, what sort of um, residences they built. Um, that's one important concept from period one. The second important con... Um, concept is sort of how contact with European cultures and indigenous cultures uh, led to um, conflict. Um, one uh, really important concept is the, occult, the Columbian exchange and whether or not to view that as a positive or negative force. Um, obviously it is both, you know, there's a huge exchange of goods and foods and livestock. There's also of course an exchange of disease, most notably being smallpox. The, the other concept is different views from these two different cultures led to a lot of social, cultural, and political change. 
Uh, a really important term to get out of this era is the encomienda system, which was a Spanish labor system created that basically exchanged uh, indigenous people's work for Spanish rule. Oftentimes Christianity would be used as a um, excuse for this. Um, two Spanish friars that sort of debated the encomienda system were Sepulveda and De La Casa. Sepulveda was the supporter of the system. De La Casa spoke against um, the encomienda system as being Christian. Uh, very well connected to that is the caste system of where there were the people born in Spain, if you recall the Peninsulares, then the, the Spanish descendants who lived in the New World, the Creoles, then the, you know, sort of the, the mixed races of the Mestizo, and then the Mulatto, which would be from uh, African slaves. The, the slave trade was issued by the Spanish um, very early on. And two other terms of really critical importance are the Columbian Exchange, which we've already discussed, and encroachment. Encroachment is the word that College Board likes to use for basically how European powers came in contact with Indians and they got into a lot of conflict about land use. This would um, be much more prevalent uh, in the English colonies uh, when we look at things like uh, Medicom's War and things like that. So that's really it for period one, uh, you know, Encomienda and where Indians lived. Um, period two starts with the first permanent settlement in Jamestown in 1607. Uh, we have sort of a, a look at John Smith, who was sort of a leader that tried to force people into work. Um, one of the issues of Jamestown was, you know, a lot of people focused on, on cash crop and quick money, uh, hence the meme in the middle. So Jamestown kind of starts this period and it ends in 1754 uh, with the French and Indian War. And the way that I classify this period is you have the first English colony, but whether or not England would have strong control over North America still had yet to be seen because you have a Spanish influence, you have a French and Dutch influence. But by 1754, when the French and Indian War starts, um, it'll basically be established that Great Britain um, is the leading European influence in what is modern day United States. So starts with Jamestown, ends with the French and Indian War. Okay, um, the first concept is to know how different European cultures had different patterns of colonization. So I basically group this into three different ways in North America. They're the Spanish, who we're already pretty familiar with from the previous period with their encomienda system and their caste, right? Then you had the French and the Dutch, which viewed the Indians as much more of a trading partner, particularly for furs and pelts. And there are the British, who would establish a number of permanent colonies. So you need to know the three influences of different European colonial groups. But then you also need to know the difference, differences of the, the British colonies. So starting from the north, heading our way south, we have uh, the New England colonies, which were often established by pilgrims and Puritans, and uh, they viewed um, the New World as a place to establish their religious groups. You have the middle colonies, which were much more diverse. Um, this would be like Pennsylvania and New York, where they're much more religiously tolerant than New England. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is pretty much focused around uh, uh, Virginia and tobacco, um, the cash crop. And then the southern colonies, uh, the Carolinas and the like, would um, focus heavily on, in the future, on um, chattel slavery. Uh, and there, there'll be some of that in the Chesapeake Bay area as well. So Chesapeake Bay, view that like Virginia, Jamestown. Um, New England is where the Puritans live. Uh, the middle colonies are often qualified as the breadbasket of America. So those are some of the critical terms. Um, um, the Atlantic economy basically refers to the sort of trade of goods back and forth between Europe and the New World. Um, you know, mercantilism will be a concept that we'll discuss. 
There are a number of conflicts uh, in this time that are notable between European powers and indigenous people, such as Metacoms or King Philip's War. Um, what you have to know about that is just that it was caused by encroachment. Uh, the Pueblo Revolt also comes up in this period. That's in the American Southwest, um, and it was basically the Pueblo fought against Spanish rule and the Encomienda system with limited success. Um, and they did have a few years where they kind of got their independence from Spain. And the Encomienda system would be reestablished. And basically what happened in the Pueblo Revolt was there was a lightning on religious restriction as long as the Pueblo people continued to work for Spain. So uh, kind of the point of this is, you know, indigenous people, Indian tribes, aren't just victims of history. They did resist against their rule. Um, they just kind of, it didn't work out for them. Uh, Courier de Bois come up in this era. You kind of connect that with the French. Uh, Courier de Bois are these guys with the, uh, you know, the leather and the frills. They are uh, looking for beaver pelts and furs. And uh, they've really viewed the Indians as more of a trade partner um, and had, uh, you know, a little more stable relationship with Indian tribes. Uh, starving time is also a concept that is often brought up here. That is when the colonists of Jamestown became so tobacco obsessed that they weren't growing enough food and there's a lot of incidents of starvation there's a few um, anecdotes of possible cannibalism that took part in jamestown um, john smith playing a lead role trying to force people that you know the idea of he who shall not work shall not eat um, and so yeah starving time often gets associated with jamestown in this period Okay, the other major concept of this era is sort of how British rule kind of becomes hot and cold. Um, and so, first of all, the early colonies were developing a pluralism. By that, that means they kind of had two identities. They were British subjects, but not British subjects. And we see that grow throughout the era where there becomes this separate American identity and this would become a lot more um, solidified in period three. Um, also, British attempts to achieve wealth in America through mercantilism kind of went hot and cold in this era. And there are time periods where they established the colonies for mercantilism and uh, they achieved wealth through things like cash crops um, and things. But over time, that it became impractical to produce um, all the manufactured goods in England. And so they kind of lightened up and let the Americans do that to an extent. And uh, this degree of independence would become uh, a lot more critical in the next period when Britain starts to crack down on these mercantilist policies again to cover, recover their debts from the French and Indian War. So in this era... You know, they started these colonies off mercantilism, and then they were very laissez-faire about it, and um, that would lead to some um, animosity in the next period. Other terms that we need to identify is the First Great Awakening, where there is a um, acceptance of a lot of new religious groups. You know, the Puritans kind of started to lighten up with their halfway covenant and let more people into their faith, and there's a lot of evangelic where they're trying to convert people. Um, and this would help establish a separate American identity. Um, you know, the Puritans, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, you know, think of things like uh, the Scarlet Letter and the Crucible and these sort of, you know, very strict religious guidelines, um, these Calvinistic views of um, religion that were very limiting. But the Puritans, keep in mind, uh, they had no intention of going back to England. So um, they established a lot more stable colonies than, say, Jamestown, which underwent the starving period. And that's not to say that, like, living in Plymouth would have been super easy either, but um, at least they had the mentality that they were here for good, whereas the people in Jamestown had this sort of adventurer mindset. Uh, 
The Enlightenment also comes up in this era. You know, a lot of people having revolutionary ideas about government and about uh, more democratic principles that will come up again in the next period. But the Enlightenment does start here. Uh, chattel slavery would be utilized in places like Virginia and the Carolinas. Uh, this is a system of bringing in African slaves that would live a permanent life as slaves. Um, the term chattel being, you know, kind of a crossing of cattle and human. Um, so this sort of belief that these slaves that replaced the indentured servants were slaves for life. Um, mercantilism, uh, huge important concept of this era. And I view mercantilism like hoarding of resources. Uh, the belief was that a mother country like Great Britain would have colonies the colony's purpose was to extract resources, you know, lumber, gold, cash crops, whatever, return them to the mother country. The mother country would manufacture the goods and then sell them to the colonies. So it was, a, you know, very centered on imperialism and sort of a hoarding of resources um, in this era. And then salutary neglect is also a very important term. So mercantilism was the purpose for the colonies, but there's also a long period of time where the, they just didn't really practice this idea and the colonies were allowed to produce their own goods. And this would uh, make it more difficult in the future when they try to tighten their grip. Oh, weird. There's two of the same slides. Okay, so in conclusion, there are some hypothetical questions I would like to pose now that we could contribute to some class discussion. Uh, the first is, how should history view Columbus? You know, is Columbus a hero or a villain? You know, the uniting of this culture and the increase of globalism and trade uh, was had a remarkable advantage. And I would say up until the 1990s, people really viewed him as a hero. Um, but in the modern day, um, due to the effects of smallpox, um, our views of the Encomienda system and our more diverse world set, people start to classify Columbus in the modern day as more of a villain. Um, you know, some of his primary source material does not contribute to this image of how he viewed the indigenous people as, you know, foolish, um, there to be manipulated. Um, so one question is Columbus himself, should he be viewed by history as a hero or a villain? And also, was the Columbian exchange a good or um, harmful force in history? And um, so that complexity certainly comes up. Uh, another hypothetical question is, who had the best relationship with the Indians? You know, was it the British with their systems of assimilation or removal? Were it the Spanish with their caste system, which, you know, did rate Europeans higher than indigenous people, but indigenous people are at least part of their system um, or by most accounts the most amicable relationship was between the indians and the french and the dutch because the french and the dutch viewed the indians as trade partners um, so just kind of that sort of ranking system in the discussion there um, one thing to do is to compare the life of new england colonies to the chesapeake bay you know keep in mind new england colonies were permanent they were formed for a religious purpose. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay colonies were made by joint stock co companies, and they were attempting to make quick profits off of cash crops. And the last concept is to understand mercantilism and how it would play a role in the relation of the British colonies. So that's basically period two. Um, we hopefully will have some discussion over that, but... That is the quick version of periods one and two and what could show up on the AP exam regarding them.